Hey everybody, it's so really nice to meet you. I'm here from New York City. Um, and um, I'm gonna, I've been part of the kind of CS50 community back from when they first made it available as a high school curriculum back in 2015. And um, as was uh, some of the presenters yesterday, we've been doing it for a while. And so I've been really thinking a lot over this last year, particularly as the AP assessments have changed for the AP CSP um, uh, performance task um, and multiple choice exam, you know, how to best fit in the CS50 curriculum to really support students. So I'm gonna share some slides and then um, feel free to ask questions as I go along. All right, but um, just to talk a little about who I am, I have uh, been teaching computer science um, uh, actually for the past six years uh, at a school called Mess Plus M in New York City. And um, I teach generally four sections of computer science, like an intro class. And I use DS50 actually um, for all of my classes um, and one section of uh, APCSP. I had a lot of students. Um, in New York, we generally have anywhere from, in my intro class is usually about 33 students in the class. And in my AP class around 25. So there's a lot of students. Um, I've also been uh, teaching CS50 at the Harvard Extension School, summer school. And I've been AP CSP reader and table leader for the last many years. So um, although I still admit I still have a lot to learn and I'm hoping that we can have some collaborative uh, sessions here as well um, where everybody can kind of share some of their thoughts on all of this. So the school I'm at, it's uh, NEST plus M is short for New Explorations into Science, Technology and Math. Um, it's a New York City public school. It's kind of unusual. It's a K to 12, what they call gifted and talented public school. One of the only ones really uh, attracts students from all five boroughs. Um, and it's on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. This is a picture of the courtyard in front of the school. And the next slide is actually my favorite picture. Um, this was a picture um, from a hackathon that we hosted at our school a couple of years ago before COVID. Um, David came, um, we had our middle school and our high school students show up and we just had a blast. And uh, it was just a Saturday afternoon as David had talked about yesterday, uh, not an all night hackathon, uh, but kind of during the daytime hours, the students had an opportunity to really spent more than their normal short classroom period working with their peers, learning new stuff and experimenting. And so it was, it was just a really fun day. So my students are really quite diverse. Um, I have students that come into my classes that know absolutely nothing about programming. Um, they might know a little bit of HTML from a web page they created in the past. Um, some of them are extremely experienced. Um, some of them want to major in CS, think they might want to major in CS, want to find out if they like CS. Um, and the uh, level of the students basically um, can be in the same classroom, students who struggle with Algebra 1 all the way through to Calc BC students. So it's a very diverse group of students. And so I've been able to use the CS50 curriculum and all the support tools um, to really be able to differentiate. And uh, I don't think I could have done it without CS50 to keep everybody engaged and everybody working at the level where exactly where they're at. Um, my students are usually 11th and 12th graders. I occasionally have a 9th or 10th grader. In my school, basically, the computer science courses are electives. And so there are so many other courses they're taking. They're programmed pretty tight. Um, from 9th and 10th grade, they don't even have room for electives. So 11th grade is the first opportunity for them to take an elective. And at my school, they usually want students to take an intro class before an AP class. Um, so we structured it so that they take uh, the introduction I'll show in a moment, the first couple of weeks of the CS50 curriculum as part of the intro curriculum. And then we take it on um, from there for the second year when they do the full AP curriculum and take the AP assessments. So I adapt, I use a lot of it as is. I also add to it, tweak it and change it around a lot. Um, for the intro classes, I've been using the CS50 labs uh, for the entire first semester. And if you're watching the recorded sessions from last year, last summer, I presented a lot on how the labs could work. And if anybody has questions, I'm happy to share with you a little bit about that today as well. But um, basically I use the material of uh, from zero, week zero, which is Scratch, week one, which is, you know, programs like um, Mario, uh, uh, sometimes uh, in the AP curriculum, there may be ISBN or, uh, more sophisticated programs like credit. And then week two, which involves strings, uh, where we have Caesar, um, maybe Visionaire, and some of the newer programs like substitution. Um, and then, so that's semester one. Now, the great thing is that because of all the materials I have um, available through CS50, for students that are more uh, experienced or just catch onto it or fall in love with it, 
There are some students who've never programmed and once they start doing the problems, they just, they just want more and more. So I'll use the more uh, comfortable versions of the programs or give them materials and videos to even work at their own pace in weeks three and sometimes even four. So um, nobody ever has to get bored, uh, but that's kind of the minimum requirements I, I have students work through. And then for semester two, there is a problem set called homepage where they make a website with four pages. I always use that as an introduction to HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And then I introduce a little bit of game design uh, using P5.js. And I've actually picked up a lot of the conceptual stuff from the CS50 game design class. I don't use the programming languages they do, Love and Lua, because I really need to use a web-based environment because everybody doesn't have computers they can install software on. So, but some of the stuff we've done, uh, Pong, we've done uh, platformer games, kind of getting a lot of the concepts from uh, CS50. Um, and then for the APCSP class, I continue with the um, weeks, kind of doing a little summary again on week two, then go into week three, four. I skip five. I don't do Stellar or memory um, allocation uh, for my high school. There's just too many students to support, even though some of them could certainly handle it. I always felt I just have too many students to really be able to individually help students in the way they might need to get through that. And then six, we do Python. Um, and then we do a little bit of uh, Flask and SQL. Um, and basically, I use a combination to, to help prepare students with uh, various different resources, some resources from AP Classroom, et cetera. Uh, my classes are normally five days a week, uh, 45 minutes a period. And this last year, we had only 30. We were totally remote for the instructional part of our day, and we only had 30 minute periods. So we weren't able to get quite as far, but um, it was still a very productive year. My own personal background, I've been teaching for 11 years, and I first um, took CS50 on edX.org, which was amazing. I was looking for a curriculum to use as I started. I started teaching at this school, started teaching computer science, um, looking for something, and had just happened to find CS50 at the right time. Um, I did take CS courses in college. I worked as a programmer the first few years of my uh, working life, and after that, worked with various software vendors. Um, I was involved with a graphic design startup. I taught myself some web design, did some early HTML stuff when HTML was really ugly, uh, but it was a, a real experience. And um, and I, I was really interested from that point on to kind of delving back in and learning more programming, particularly more modern languages. Um, and so I often tried to take various CS courses online, but quite frankly, I just couldn't stay with them. I just found them to be not very exciting. I just couldn't stay with it. So when I found CS50, I just fell in love with it. It was so engaging, I just couldn't put it down. So I've always taken that excitement with me, I think, into the classroom. So what I wanted to talk a little about today were the APCSP assessments, um, particularly some thoughts I had, some ideas, and I'm always interested in kind of seeing um, who else down the road might want to collaborate on some of these uh, different uh, programs that I've been tweaking to help make them work uh, with the AP curriculum. So I wanted to start with the create performance task. Um, so as, as those of you who are involved um, in the AP end of things, as you know, there's been new requirements this past year. Um, programs have to have an array or a list, a dictionary, some other kind of collection type, function with a parameter, um, but the function also has to include iteration and selection, and the iteration, or rather the selection, has to uh, be in involving the parameter. So there's some really specific requirements, and I found sometimes it wasn't really that easy to come up with an idea of a program that satisfied all those requirements. Um, and then the written responses, there's only a, a rubric of six rows, as you've probably seen. And um, having been an AP reader this year, I mean, there are many, many, many things that students need to do just to get one point. So you can have everything perfect. And um, as we'll see in a moment, you talk about the function instead of the purpose of the program, you lose the entire point for row one. And I know somebody pointed that out in the chat window yesterday. So just please note, I'm, I'm gonna try to open my chat window. Um, I It's hard for me to see all the chat messages. Um, Oh, nice. I see somebody is in New York City. That would be great. I'd love to connect with people and just stay in touch throughout the course of the year. So uh, please, please feel free to do that. And, and please note, it's not always easy for me to see the chat window um, when I'm sharing my screen. Okay. Um, so some of the thoughts I had was that it would be really nice as I'm going through the CS50 curriculum to have students work on a, a program that satisfied the create requirements in Scratch, in C, and in Python with the written responses. So Doug kind of uh, touched on that a little bit yesterday in having students um, work together um, with him in his uh, building a birdhouse, I guess, part of his curriculum to do a Scratch program. And then he had them write up a response to it, which I think is a great idea. Um, I came up with a very 
not a very good, a very simple scratch program, which barely meets the requirements, but just to be able to demonstrate. I had um, a, one student who really struggled this year and wanted to do his crate test in scratch. And so I came up with it quickly and I'll share it with you, but you all probably have much better ideas um, to really have students maybe even have a program specification where they're actually creating a program in scratch and then writing up the sample create test you know, uh, responses, which are, as Doug mentioned yesterday, the, the part they're really being graded on. I think I thought it'd be really interesting if in, uh, once they get to C, maybe in unit one, one of the programs that they complete has also that required a particularly a list and a function. And maybe when they get to unit two and they're working with strings, um, they one of the programs that they work on has a, um, a list or some kind of a dictionary and a, um, a function with a parameter, et cetera. So that by the time they get to the create test, they really, really know what they need to do. Um, so I've started to kind of come up with some things I'll share with you in a few moments. But um, you know, as I mentioned, the program specs uh, can be very confusing. I found them to be, uh, or rather the uh, requirements for CREATE, I found to be pretty confusing. I spent a good amount of time on the AP discussion board, you know, just trying to really clarify exactly what they were looking for. Um, so I thought it would be really interesting if we had actual program specs, um, maybe something I would write up. I don't know if Carter and Bernie would be involved or maybe some of you, but we had program specs to complete programs that have that function with a parameter and a function call. Um, that the function has a loop and a conditional, and that different branches of that conditional would execute depending on the argument being passed. Um, and also that the program, the array or the list has to be purposeful. Um, and again, the written response would be included as part of that problem so that by the time they actually get to the create test, they're really familiar with it. And I guess I was thinking this could be because I had them do a practice create test this year where they created their own program from scratch. It took forever. It just took so much time. So I thought maybe it would be more productive to have them actually work on a problem specification where they now have gone through it, we go through the solution, they write everything up and we could be very, very clear. So the types of possible sample programs I came up with, um, I came up with, for instance, in Scratch and in C and in Python, uh, a grade, uh, just a grade calculator where you put in a number of grades and you would then, for instance, uh, be told, did, did that equate to an A or B or a, a C or a D or whatever? So this is the simple little scratch program I put together. And again, I did this for the one student who was trying to figure out what exactly he needed to do to have the requirements and very simple. And I, I have a, um, a Google uh, Drive uh, folder that I'm gonna share with you all in a bit that has all this in it that you can see the link to this. But basically, you know, I have an input here. The input uh, is a list, the list has all of the grades and depending on the average, you generate an A, B, C, D, or an F, right? Again, not very exciting, but kind of a minimal program that satisfies the requirements. So I guess what I was thinking that maybe it'd be nice to have samples, like before students even start on their the problem spec to solve the problem, they could actually look at existing code um, to really understand it and break it down so that they really have a good idea of what they need to do. This one is an example of a C program that I created that does the same thing, basically. So we have a list. And we have um, an array in C, right? And then we calculate, we have a calculate function that similar to the uh, Scratch program calculates an A, B, C, D, or an F. Um, and it should have all the requirements, right? Because you have different branches that execute, dep execute depending on what the input is. Um, the input is a list, it has to be a list. Why does it have to be a list? Because you can't really have a variable number of grades without having some kind of a list. So I, in my estimation, it kind of, it satisfies what you need to do. And then the same thing in Python. And what I did this year is that I actually went over this with the students. I, um, I created a, a, like an exemplar um, using this Python program for them to use with an exemplar written response, which um, quite honestly, after being an AP reader, I probably wouldn't got a hundred or a six out of six anyway, uh, because of the difference between function and purpose. Um, but so those are what I was thinking in terms of the maybe just samples, right? So we have a program, we can show it to the student, we could go through it and kind of explain what parts of this uh, would be necessary uh, in order to have the function and the list that satisfy the requirements. And then I was thinking it might be nice to have problem sets that the students do that, or maybe just sometimes a tweaked problem spec that satisfies all the requirements. So some of the things I was thinking about, um, at Harvard last year, they did uh, labs with each unit, which were really great. Had, there were more practice problems that students worked on before they got to their problem sets. And one of the labs for the uh, week one uh, was called Scrabble. 
And what Scrabble does, and I could show it to you in just a moment, what Scrabble does is it uh, tells you if the points basically for a word, like a Scrabble word. And what I was thinking with a minor change to the CSV existing, there actually is a CS50 problem spec that was used at Harvard last year. With a minor change, um, it could be a problem, a unit one problem that satisfies the criteria. So I'm gonna stop sharing this just for a moment and I'm gonna go to my IDE and I'll show you a little bit more what I'm talking about. So I'm just refreshing my IDE, it kind of turned out. Does anybody have any questions in the meantime? or any yeah. comments. Margaret, let me, um, I'll read one of the questions that came up. So uh, have you found the same issues Douglas did yesterday about students doing better earlier in the year? And that's from- In terms Stephen. of working on working on create really early in the year? I believe so. You know, that's a really good question. So my AP students have already done some coding in C by the time they take my AP class. And to be honest, most of them don't want to go back to scratch. Um, I have a, always a couple of struggling students in that class that prefer to use scratch. But for the most part, most of them really want to learn how to program more sophisticated stuff. And they enjoy the challenge of writing a more sophisticated program. So I've done it more halfway through the year. I don't wait until the end. Um, because as I'll talk about in a moment, it always seems to be the the, they, they, they overcomplicate it. And probably like the more we did, the more complicated the program would be and the longer it takes to program. So I'm going to show you in a moment, I've come up with some ideas on even putting together some guidelines on how to approach the create task um, to really try to help students realize that they shouldn't be spending, because for the create performance test, we have to give them 12 hours. Um, in my case, with 45 minute periods, it's almost a month of class time where I'm not really allowed to help them one on one. It's a lot of time. And so I try to give them advice in terms of how to structure their time. Of course, many of them don't listen to it. And they usually take the majority of time to work on the program. So um, in any case, I don't know if that answers your question. So I usually do it halfway through the year. What I did in the last few years, and I'm totally changing my thoughts on it this year, was that I thought it would be easier for them to write their program in Python because Python is such a powerful language. But I think now for next year, I'm gonna highly recommend that they write their program in C. And uh, part of the reason is that Python is so powerful, it's hard to write a function that has to do all those things um, without writing a really sophisticated program. Because in C, if you write a linear search function, that function, and you give it an input um, of a target value maybe and an array, the linear search function functions, it satisfies the function requirements for create. and um, do you need to write a linear search function in Python? I mean, you could, but it's kind of like writing bad Python because Python does it for you automatically. So um, so for those reasons, next year, I'm going to highly recommend that students do their create tasks in C earlier in the year, like before we get to, or maybe just introduce a tiny bit of Python um, and then uh, have them do their create task uh, after that. So that students who, some, there are some students that come in knowing Python and love Python and want to work in Python. But I think that, for the majority of students uh, that are not experienced in Python, I'm going to recommend C. Um, I hope I answered your question. So I'll probably do it like in the uh, end of the fall semester uh, in this coming year, sometime around that time. Um, other questions? Uh, we have another one from Esther here. If you have 10 set of 90 minute classes and um, she's speaking about summer class, I guess, um, how would you create the curriculum module while teaching them? Um, if I have 10 set of 90 minute classes, I'd have to really think about, it. in other words, how to break down the curriculum to get everything done um, in not 10 times 90 minutes, 10 90 minute classes. Um, I mean, I would guess that they would have to have a lot more homework than I give my students. I allow my students to work on their problems most of the class time is them doing their coding problems so that I'm there, so they're there to support each other. But I would think when you have such a limited amount of time to do it, they'd really have to uh, complete a lot of their programs for homework um, and maybe even you know, use the lectures, uh, assign them as homework so that they watch the lectures and then maybe they come in with questions and kind of review the key points and uh, really use that class time, like have them maybe do a good amount of their programming for homework and then coming in and doing a lot of problem solving, debugging, clarifying questions, things like that. Um, to really kind of get the most, because the most valuable part
part of you, right, is going to be helping them uh, with the problems that they encounter. That's my experience also, right? Because they can get a lot of information from videos, but there's also going to be confusion. I don't quite understand this, or I don't know how to fix this bug. Um, and so I think having you uh, be present with them to help them with that is probably going to be one of the more valuable uses of your time. Um, I'm looking at another question here. Uh, I don't know if it's a question or just a comment that you are making to each other. So, um, Bernie, any other questions? Sure. sure. This is from Miguel. So, after uh, the question I just read, this is another one from Miguel. Margaret, considering classes five times a week, you do each course week in how much time? And then I guess one week class per course a week. Right. So, um, I don't strictly map one week to one CS50 week. So, um, because my students also are often taking like five AP classes. They have a lot of stresses in their life and they, um, and uh, CS, you know, computer science is an elective. Um, they don't even, they don't need it to graduate where they need, do need other things. So I, my, my philosophy, I don't want to stress them out that much. Um, and um, they're very competitive. They're really always looking to get into the, you know, high ranking colleges. And so um, I, it kind of depends on the group of students. So it's not like I have a, totally big, it depends. Like sometimes I go slower than other times. Um, but at the beginning for my AP class, they've already seen the work in, most of the work in unit two. So I may have them finish that up in a week um, and then like move on unit three is around algorithms. And I'll also introduce other programs. So I don't just do the programs that are done at, at the Harvard level, which are just a couple of problems in a problem set. Um, I'll have them do searching and sorting algorithms and I'll show that in a moment. And, you know, other programs as well to make sure they really understand the, uh, algorithmic issues, you know, and then for images, I might help them with some of the stuff in unit four around that. So um, I have basically, a I, I don't have a, a, an exact map from one week of CS50 to one week of what I'm doing. Um, it would probably be, you know, because basically we do for the AP class, you know, it's what I say, two, three, and four um, is really gonna, or at least two and three uh, before doing the, AP, the, the create task. And then there's a whole month they have to have to give them to do the create task. So, uh, and then we'll come back and we'll continue to do, because I don't need them to do the image stuff before create. Um, anyway, this year I'm gonna do it a little differently. So I'm still thinking a little bit about the structure of it, because I am gonna be pushing C a lot more than I did this current year. This current year, we were totally remote. The students didn't even really finish the year before. Uh, many of them dropped off the spectrum. You know, they just barely came to class. So I knew that they didn't really have as much experience coming into the AP class. So I kind of started it pretty early on in Python, um, but I'm gonna do it a little differently this year. How do I engage students online? Um, well, what I've done online again, is that uh, in the past, I never really uh, assigned the CS50 lectures to watch for homework because I didn't really, I know that all students didn't at that time have computers at their, at the, available to them at home. Uh, most of them did, but there were always a few that didn't. So I didn't think that was fair. I would make it optional, but it wasn't required. This year when we were remote, everybody had a computer at home. So I assigned to watch some of the CS50 lectures, portions like uh, two chapters you know, for homework. And then I would do a couple of warm-up questions to kind of at the beginning of class to see who is familiar with that material. And then I would pretty quickly have them working together in breakout rooms. So for the most part, most of the class time was the students working together in breakout rooms, solving problems, collaborating, um, and then I would pop around and visit all the breakout rooms. And I let them work with their friends because they didn't really have the chance to socialize like they normally would. So I would pop into the various breakout rooms and you know have conversations with them and you know just kind of try to keep the excitement going. Um, so that was that was basically that was, that was what I did. Um, so I'm seeing uh, ch children 10, 12 years old, Python first. Um, you know, whatever, I think that, um, See with the training wheels, just, I mean, I would never do, uh, you know, the more advanced units, but I think certainly uh, unit one, uh, week one in C um, can be done by middle school kids as well. I don't think, uh, I think it's pretty straightforward. And the syntax is really beneficial because it's so similar to JavaScript or Java. Like once you get familiar with the curly braces and the semicolons, um, you know, but I think, you know, there's so many different ways to start teaching. You could just do simple stuff in Python too. And that may be, a little less, I don't know, 
uh, frustrating for kids. They don't have to compile, they don't have to worry about data types and all that. So, um, all right. Okay, so I was gonna go on, if that's okay, I was gonna show um, one of the CS50 problems and how I tweaked it to basically satisfy the create task. All right, and then feel free also, just feel free to kind of uh, do ask more questions when they come up. So this, uh, this is my IDE, and this is a version of Scrabble. So Scrabble, as I said, was a, uh, if there's a CS50 problem spec for it, it was done at Harvard last year as a lab, um, not in the lab environment, but basically practice problem before getting into this, the uh, unit one problems. And uh, what it is, it assigns points to each letter um, in a word. And so an array is necessary, or certainly makes the coding much more efficient, right? Because without an array, you would have to have like a if else statements that go like a chain of 26 statements, which would be really inefficient coding. Um, and the um, the problem spec itself does have you make a, a function. So they already give you the function prototype and you're basically getting a string to two words, two strings, and you're using the compute score function to calculate the score. And then this part would be the part that would be part of the problems that you would complete, you would just gonna say who wins, and then you have the score. So normally you just need to do this. You would just need to iterate through every um, letter in the word and then add up the points depending on what letter is, right? You're using the ASCII code, making it uppercase, subtracting capital A, so it's gonna correspond from zero to 25, and then that's gonna to correspond to an index in the points array. Um, and so using that array is a very, is really the not the only way to write the program, but tremendously more efficient than not using an array. Um, but this, I mean, barely doesn't really satisfy that criteria that much because there's no if statement in there. Um, so what I thought is if we just have like one little statement here that says, if in Scrabble, you're not allowed to have a word with a, a one letter on it, right? There's no points for a one letter word. So I just added this one little thing. If the length of the word is just one character long, return zero. Now you have your selection. And if you uh, put in a word of one letter, you have a whole different branch of this uh, function that you're going to complete than if you have a letter of multiple characters. So in my thinking, this would really satisfy the, the criteria for the create. There's already a problem spec written for it. Um, and the only, only difference, the check 50 would have to be tweaked. Um, the only difference is adding this one little criteria here. So that was one thing I thought could work pretty well. Um, and it's a unit one program. It's not that hard and it's kind of a fun program. You're thinking about a game. Um, and so what I was thinking is that, and I haven't done this yet. Again, I'm gonna plan on doing this next year, have students do this um, in unit one and uh, as one of the problem sets and then have them write up the response to create based on this. Um, another uh, thing I thought like for unit two could be a modification of substitution. So substitution is a CS50 problem where you're using um, at the command line, right? And a jumbled up alphabet uh, that you substitute depending on the position, position of the letter in the alphabet, you substitute that letter for the letter in the plain text. And so um, there's uh, various uses of uh, arrays. Um, I created, so again, I created a tweaked version of this for the problem spec. I made sure there was a function that return true or false uh, to, in order to validate the key. And, and then there is a, um, an array also that's used, um, which makes it uh, possible to save uh, the letters that are going to be um, printed out in the ciphertext. So what I did basically, which is a little bit different, is that I created a, a function and uh, we have here another array that just tells if the letter was used or not, which is similar to the way you might do it with the standard problem spec, but it's not required to have a function. So I thought this would be great to have my students do this requiring the function, tweaking the problem spec. Um, and then if I, uh, over here, if they validate the key in a function, if they find one letter in the key that's not an alphabetic character, or if they find one of the letters was already used, a repeated letter, you return false, and if you don't return false, you go through everything and there's nothing wrong with anything in that um, key, you return true. So, um, so again, two different branches and the key, depending on what the key is, a key with repetitive letters or a key uh, with a letter that's not alphabetic um, will return a different branch of the function. So it seems to me this could work as well. And in addition, 
there is a requirement of having an array. And you kind of do have to have an array in order to have a place to store the letters in a meaningful way to be able to output them when you're outputting the ciphertext. So again, um, I am uh, not sure if CS50 wants to kind of tweak the problem spec, if Bertie uh, or um, Carter would want to do that, or I'm happy to do that and share that. But I thought that that would be really uh, beneficial to um, kind of use problems like that in the course of teaching the, prod, the, 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 the material. Do you know what I mean? Not just uh, when we're ready for the create test now, uh, but as we're going through the material with every unit, we have a function, we have a parameter, we have a selection, we have iteration, we have all the requirements of the time after the students get even just, if sorry, even just done with maybe the scratch project and unit one, they're ready to write the create test. They don't even need unit two. Um, but maybe I, I was thinking of having them do it like you did maybe the little scratch thing for practice, unit one, unit two. Maybe at that point we'll see, or maybe uh, not uh, have them do the, um, the create test. Also in unit three, there already is a problem called um, plurality a voting problem. And in that problem, there's a linear search. And so that also could function as a create test, although it's a, probably a much more complicated program that most students are going to actually write on their own. Um, in that, you're really just writing two functions. Um, and uh, the other thing I thought was really important was to have students, let me find my slides again here, um, to have students uh, actually write the function call. I've, I've had a lot of problems with my students. I just find one of the hardest things for them sometimes, not all students, but some students, is to really understand the idea of a function. And since they have to have a screen capture of the function call and a screen capture of the function itself, um, also, on, to be honest, online, some students were a little checked out. So it was hard to know if they just weren't listening or if it just was a very difficult concept to understand. But I think what I'm gonna do with these programs this year is not give them the function definition and just have them complete the to-do, but actually make them write the whole function, including the function definition, including the parameters, and including the function call. So that it's very clear to them by the time they get finished with unit two or week two, that this is how you write a function. This is what a function call is. This is what a parameter is. This is what we mean also by iteration and selection, which is a little bit of a different terminology than we might just use a loop and a if statement, but just to make sure that it's totally, totally familiar. Um, so. So that was what I was thinking for C, right? And uh, I just said anything with a, a linear search function. And then in, uh, in Python, I wrote a program. I don't have a program spec for it. I used it as a, a demo program again. And um, so what that was, was if I can find it here, I think it's in my IDE under create scramble. I made a, a, a program where they had to, um, I had this like simple little list, where is it word list? that I imported um, as a CSV file or as a text file. And then I, I scrambled up using Python, I scrambled the letters in that um, word. And then I had them, I had I created a function check word where um, I found in Python that it was quite difficult to come up with meaningful ways of using iteration and a conditional um, without sometimes using bad Python. So um, in any case, I, I put the uh, selection in here by checking if the length of the guess wasn't equal to the length of the word. I put a lot of comments in here to make it clear. This is selection, this is iteration and, um, and letter by letter. So why did I have iteration? In Python, I could have just compared one word to the other very easily, but in order to have the iteration, I ended up uh, creating a loop. So again, um, I kind of felt that in Python, because of the power of Python, um, it was a little bit more challenging to come up with a, a good program that uh, wasn't bad Python. Because as I said, I, um, let me go back to my slides, hold on. In Python, I felt that um, it's just so powerful that um, it was hard sometimes to do it that, I ended up teaching my students like bad Python. Like don't just say if something in a, a, a list because the AP reader may not recognize that that's iteration, that's linear search. Um, and then also substitution, you could do it in Python, um, create a converted program spec as well if you wanted to stress Python with students. Um, so some of the areas where I found students struggle and also as an AP reader, and I saw somebody mention this yesterday also, uh, where students lost points. Um, there were a lot of lost points on the create task. So when I was grading the create test, 
I very rarely gave anybody six points. And again, a lot of them were done in block-based programs. A lot of them used the same. They must have had in one of the curriculums uh, the same exact um, sample problems where they got uh, a little bit of sample data and they got a column from it and they got another column from it and then they had uh, indices in the arrays that corresponded to each other and they did a linear search to find something, found the item in the other list over and over and over again. Um, but the idea where a lot of points were lost was purpose versus function. And quite honestly, I would have lost a point on that too. It just, I should have seen it, but I just didn't. So purpose really had to be um, the, uh, regarding the user. So if I had um, this grading program, right? If I said the purpose was to calculate a letter grade, that's what the program does. Um, I would have to say something like the purpose was to help the teacher easily um, find the letter grade for a series of number grades. So um, the semantics, the little bit of language was enormously uh, made a big difference in that point. And it's kind of a shame because there were so many things students had to do for that role, right? They had to make a video, they had to talk about what the program did in more detail. Um, and yet many, pro many, many students lost a point on that because they simply didn't talk about the purpose as the purpose of the program from the user's point of view. Um, also a list has to be purposeful. So some, some students have a list, but didn't really have a list that did very much or was necessary in the program. Um, another area points were often lost for how the list manages complexity. Um, basically not really giving a good rationale for why there was a list. Uh, so uh, that was really necessary. Also noting that the iteration in the list have, have, has to be purposeful. So you could have um, a function that has iteration, but if the iteration doesn't really result in anything, it doesn't really do anything, you lose the point on that. Um, another big area for students losing points was describing how the function contributed to overall functionality of the program. A lot of people described what the, what the function did, but didn't really connect it to the whole program. Um, and it's a shame, a lot of these programs, you know, could have been really great programs, but again, because of the way the response was written up, um, they lost the point. Um, a lot of confusion about two hypothetical function calls. So the last of the questions for row six, they asked about two different function calls. A lot of people interpreted that as two calls in the program. It was really just two hypothetical uh, calls with different um, arguments passed in the function. Um, and each it did, and then write about how each one of those causes a different branch of your iteration um, to execute a different branch of the function to execute. Um, there was a lot of confusion about the function call versus the function definition. So these were things that I plan on, again, by allowing them to not just do like one practice test that takes like almost a month, but really just have them work on problem specs now where they're doing these things uh, as part of the curriculum and then having them write up I usually have them write a reflection, kind of as Doug was talking about. And I got that idea from Doug in year one that I was doing this. Um, I usually have them write a reflection about their development process. So instead, I'm going to have them write up the responses to the uh, create test. Um, so other issues that came up um, was that the written response asked you to describe, of course, uh, how your what your procedure does and how it contributes to the program. And that whole response is supposed to be in enough detail for somebody else to recreate it, that whole response is supposed to be done in 200 words. I mean, of course, you could go a little over 200 if the whole response was supposed to be for the entire written response, 750 words, but they give you the extra 100 as leeway. But after that, they cut off typing words into these little boxes they give you. So it's just another thing to keep in mind when students are trying to create a function that's too complicated, it becomes difficult to do that in such a short period of time, such a short number of words. So, um, exactly, you know, yeah, I'm looking at some of the comments here. Yeah, so I, I'm looking at someone commenting that uh, Matthew said, I don't think you can do the performance test too early in this way. Your students not be sophisticated enough to answer the questions. Yeah, no, I, I do tend to agree. I, um, I don't wait until the end though. Um, because I have mostly seniors in my AP class, and quite honestly, toward the end of the year, they're already admitted to college, they're half checked out. I, the first year I did this, I had them do it at the end of the year, and um, there was, it was already a waning enthusiasm for school, um, you know, senioritis and all that. So I really need to do it, I think, um, at the end of the, this year I did it at the beginning of second semester, um, this, because I was teaching them Python, and Python was new to them, and we had such short classes, they weren't ready. But this year, I'm going to think I'm probably going to do it as part of what we do in semester one. 
um, because I think by that time they should have enough experience, particularly if we do these problems uh, with problem specs and written uh, responses, they should have enough uh, time to do it uh, by the end of semester one. Um, so yeah, the function has to be on the simple side, but yet it has to have these requirements. And again, as I was saying before, I think I just found it much harder to come up with an appropriate function in Python than in C, right? Because Python, you don't even have to have a lot of code to iterate through something to get a max or a min or an average. I mean, you can, but it's not really good Python, right? Um, and I remember in like one of the programs, I was converting plurality to have them, because uh, I thought it's a great program. So I converted it to Python. I rewrote the program spec to do it in Python. And then I got to the both function and I was thinking, oh, it should be if name and names. You're looking to see if the name of the candidate is in the names, um, I forget what it is, I guess the name's dictionary. So um, if name and names, that's how you would do it in Python, right? And what is that? It's a linear search. But when I posted that question on the AP discussion board, I was told that, um, you know, the reader may not recognize that as a loop. So you better not teach them a very sophisticated way to do it, do it very simple. So here I am having to teach my student to say for name and names, if name equals equals whatever, you know, the name that's given, return true. So um, whereas in C, you're forced to do it that way. So that's why I'm more convinced this year um, than in past years that um, it may be easier to come up with a simple function in C than um, trying to do something in Python. Um, so again, these were some of my, I just already said this, some of the own personal experiences that I given the short classes, I started the year pretty much with Python um, and uh, ended up teaching them bad top Python for this test, which I really felt terrible about. Um, and um, I also made a bunch of different slides and videos guiding students to create. I put that in a Google folder, I'll share that with you. And um, because some of the uh, things I found students doing was um, uh, just taking way too much time. So I'll, I'll just share that with you quickly. I'm running out of time, I realize I'm talking a lot, right? So I did this type of thing and I shared it in here. Some of this really needs to be tweaked, um, but just really, you know, taking a look at all the different steps you need for the create performance test, because a lot of students think it's just about writing a program that you have to do all this, right? And coding the program, troubleshooting, testing, refining, repeating, that's just a little part of the process. That's not the whole thing. And so I also tried to clarify college board terms and that your program has to have all these things in it. Um, some reasons why students may want to list, some ideas on why you might want a dictionary if you're doing it in Python, et cetera. So, um, so those were some of the things that I uh, did and everything is in the Google folder that I shared. So moving on, I think I pretty much finished this, right? That just too much time. And even with all that, I made videos, I explained it all, I walked through stuff, I walked through my samples and still students spend most of their time coding their programs. So I'm hoping this year, having more familiarity with what these functions are gonna look like and simple programs that could satisfy the criteria, it'll be a little more straightforward. Um, some of the things I did to augment the curriculum for the multiple choice exam is that I created a, a series of searching and sorting labs, um, doing linear search, binary search, bubble sort, selection sort, even merge sort, which I never really assigned because it's a little more difficult. I, with one or two students who are curious, I kind of had them uh, work on that uh, optionally. And those were labs in the lab environment with the specs on the left so that they could work on those on their own. And I assigned those for homework. And then we went over them together in class. I also created some labs and I shared all of these in the uh, Google Doc uh, folder um, using a simulation. So uh, when you get far enough into the CS50 curriculum, into uh, SQL, you start to see some ideas of cleaning data, et cetera, to be able to do data analysis. But I also wanted them to see programs that use the random function uh, to do simulation. And so I created a lab that does that, including uh, like a simple little program similar to the HD problems where you want to simulate 80% of the students getting a particular grade using a random function. And then also the Monty Hall program, uh, Monty Hall problem, uh, which uh, again, it's, it's in the lab with the specifications on the left. And then I also, to also help students understand more about cleaning data and visualization, um, I, I created a program, a COVID analysis program where um, students had to actually clean data and in Python, uh, there is a GitHub repo in um, the New York Times has that making it publicly available of all the state data from the beginning of time. And so, uh, oh, I think it's over here, it's a link. So uh, over here, I made a, a Python program that uh, using Plotly, which is amazing, a fairly simple program 
that outputs a graph like this, uh, it creates an HTML file. You can then open it up with the HTTP server and the IDE. And students really enjoyed this. And then I also gave them a file with a number of uh, uh, people in each state, which a file that had data that had to be cleaned. And so we worked on it, we cleaned the data together and then completed this. And I have to say, they really found it uh, very relevant, obviously. They really enjoyed doing this. So, um, so that was something I did for uh, the COVID analysis. And then for the internet uh, part of the test, I used some of the code.org videos, AP Classroom videos, um, et cetera, et cetera. And um, some ideas I had uh, that I would be happy to share with people, or again, if uh, any other teachers would like to work on this, is that I thought it would be great to have, you know how the AP Classroom has all these sample questions in it. I thought it'd be really nice to have um, like a little quiz that goes with each unit, but the quiz also incorporates some of the pseudocode like sample questions that involve loops or involve conditionals or if else statements um, and actually have students do these as quizzes uh, with each week of the curriculum so that it's not just doing up, up till now I've mostly just done that type of test prep at the end of the year before the multiple choice exam but I think it would be really effective to do it more as integrate it more as we go along and I'd love to see that I don't know if Bernie and Carter open to it maybe even linked those kind of little quizzes that use some of the AP questions may be linked, and maybe it could be teacher resources, I don't know, but linked to each week in the AP curriculum. Um, and also just making sure to introduce some of the terminology that they use on the AP procedure selection iteration, uh, which is a little bit different than functions, if statements and loops, you know, which uh, I tend to use uh, with CS50. And again, also make sure they get more practice writing functions and function calls. Um, from earlier on, because I do find that's an area they always uh, uh, struggle with. And then just also using CS50 has get, had some great labs they used last year as preparatory uh, problems uh, for their problem sets and uh, possibly incorporating more of those as well, just to have more practice problems. So that's, that's kind of it uh, for my presentation.